1642, the beginning of a conflict that would change English history forever. Conflicting ideals on royal authority brought King Charles I into direct conflict with the forces of Parliament. For centuries, royal power had gone unchallenged in the country. Long-standing loyalties and traditions brought not just the nobility of the country, but the common man to arms against one another. At the beginning of the English Civil War, um, you, you have a country that has not seen close combat, or the threat of close combat, and since the threat of the Spanish Armada in 1588. So the English Welsh population was far from used to any form of military action. To a landlocked nation, such a standing army would have little to no purpose. But with the realization that conflict was on the horizon, the realities of having to form an army that at the time was non-existent became evident to both sides. As the war approached, you had a country that had no standing army. The nearest they got to it was what were called train bands, and train bands were county-based. We'd probably recognize them as a form of militia. These train bands would invariably turn out once or twice a year in a form of country fair, where the men would get together and no doubt not just enjoy the benefits of military training. In such turbulent times, the common man was often left out of political affairs. The management of the country was under control of a small aristocracy, comprising mainly those of noble birth and the very wealthy. Deciding on what side to fight on often came down to practicality. How a member of the public decided which side to support, primarily depending on geographic region or who perhaps their lord and master was. It is often said, for example, or the perception is that the royalist side had more lords and ladies, which is actually incorrect. There were more on the parliament calls. The country was split into different regions, with loyalty changing from area to area. But landed gentry would have had significant numbers of tenants. If the, if the lord, the lady, had gone to one cause, therefore his tenants went on that side. London was very much parliamentarian controlled, therefore the vast majority of the population in London supported Parliament, as was um, what became the Eastern Association or East Anglia, very Pur Puritan based and therefore supporters of Parliament. However, in Cornwall, there was very much a royalist bias. So the country was geographically split. Uh, it's why the king, when war was declared, started to form his armies in the north of England. 1644. Under command of Prince Rupert, the royalists trapped in the city of York had the duty of fighting off a large number of parliamentarian and Scottish enemies, culminating in a battle that would be the turning point in the entire conflict. One of the largest battles on English soil fought at Master Moor, and one of the bloodiest, was fought and the Royalist army lost. The armies were destroyed. If those Royalist armies had been victorious, it would have left the Royalist cause totally in control of the country and able to advance on London. One fascinating but not unexpected occurrence of the war was the modernization of the military. In a land that had not seen a proper standing army in centuries, evolution of the military was sure to follow, and it would alter the country's history forever. The creation of the new model army proved to be extremely decisive for the Parliament cause. Originally coming out of um, the political arguments within the Parliament cause, where field commanders such as the Earl of Essex were holding, uh, were M members of Parliament and refusing to support other members of Parliament such as Sir William Waller. And it was appreciated that the war would never be won whilst this sort of action took place. Without the new model army, it's unlikely that the parliamentarians could have managed to stand up to the forces of Charles I. The new model army went on from victory to victory and is considered one of the best armies that ever existed in England and certainly was the beginning of what we now know as the British Army.